So um, thank you very much for coming. I'm based in the physics department here. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the Royal Society. I have a position uh, funded by the Royal Society, which actually gives me a lot of flexibility to work on things which I know both a lot about and which I don't know that necessarily that much about. And I'm afraid this talk is m very much in the latter camp. Um, so I may think, say things that are either blindingly obvious or unbelievably obscure, and I won't actually know which these are. So please bear with me. Um, in fact, I, I should just explain a little bit about myself. So my, my sort of principal day job is actually doing climate modeling. Um, and that involves quite a lot of computer science and particularly supercomputer science. Um, but my PhD many years ago was in uh, general relativity theory and Roger was my uh, actually internal examiner from many years back. My supervisor was Dennis Sharma, a uh, famous cosmologist. Um, and I keep quite an active interest in uh, fundamental physics and some of the things that Roger talked about yesterday. And this talk is a little bit of a, a, a mixture of all three of these areas, as I say, into a, a field about which I, uh, I am absolutely not, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert. Um, and in fact, the things I'm going to say about consciousness, I, I thought when I prepared this talk were outlandishly speculative, um, but I realized there actually are some connections with the things that both Roger and uh, Stuart Hameroff uh, said yesterday. So I feel actually a little bit better about that now, so it's not going to be quite so wild uh, as I perhaps thought originally. But I want to start uh, talking about uh, creativity, uh, human creativity. But actually, to really start things off, I'm going to um, refer to the very first uh, sentence of an abstract I wrote, uh, of a paper I wrote, the abstract of a paper I wrote in Nature uh, Physics Reviews only a, a month or two ago about stochastic uh, weather and climate models. And the first sentence of the abstract says, although the partial differential equations that describe the physical climate system and the Navier-Stokes equations are you know, an example of that, are deterministic, there are important reasons, or there is an important reason, why the computational representation uh, of these equations should be stochastic. Um, so this, is, uh, this paper is trying to extol the virtues of stochasticity in a system which, at some very underlying level, um, is deterministic. Now, uh, in, in practice, in, um, in, com in stochastic climate models, we introduce stochasticity with uh, you know, the usual pseudo-random number generators, uh, which, is, which works fine. But of course, that takes some computational cost. And as we'll see, computational cost is a real premium, and in particular, the energy of computation is a real premium these days in supercomputing. So for, so for many years, I've actually been quite interested in the concept of actually trying to generate stochasticity from the hardware itself, rather than generating through software. And uh, one reason for that is that you would then gain the energy at actually in a negative, uh, 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 or the, 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 there would actually be a negative cost in, in getting the stochasticity from hardware. So to be explicit about this, um, you know, very simply you can say this, if you start to turn down the voltage across a transistor, at some stage it will cease to be a reliable gate, it'll start to become faulty. But maybe there are many computations where you can tolerate faults, um, and effectively where you can, uh, you can benefit from the noise that such a, 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 um, a low energy system would, would obtain. So this was uh, some work done by a colleague of mine in the Rice University in Texas, developing what he called PCMOS. Uh, CMOS is a type of uh, you know, metal oxide semiconductor technology that basically is used to make chips. Uh, and this is essentially a low energy version of that, um, which makes occasional faults, uh, depending on what the voltage is. Um, and the principal application of this originally was for image processing and the idea that this might actually prolong the life of your iPhone by you know, the couple of days, certainly in the days when you, the life of, a, of an iPhone was very short. But I got quite interested in this as a, as a potential technique for uh, generating um, stochasticity from hardware. So the point is you actually are, by reducing the voltage, you're saving energy and generating the noise you need, which can actually, as I say, from a computational point of view, can be advantageous. Um, now, the reason for saying this is that as we go to really high performance computing, and we're now sort of facing the dawn of uh, what's called exascale co uh, computing, 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second, the principal 
uh, constraint in uh, preventing this happening uh, or, or preventing this from have hap happening already is actually energy. Uh, we're, we've sort of lost the days of what's called Moore's law where computers just uh, double every speed of computers double every year because you can more and more miniaturize your uh, transistors and so uh, supercomputing is getting faster and faster by just basically becoming more and more parallel but this is producing uh, extraordinarily energetically complex uh, pieces of, uh, of equipment. And this uh, from the Department of Energy a few years ago was bemoaning the fact that based on this was written, I don't know, in mid, maybe a few, three or four years ago, was, was projecting that in 2020, based on current uh, trends, uh, the exascale computer would consume about 200 megawatts of power. I mean, this is like a power station's worth of power. Uh, which is clearly untenable, and the target was for 20 to 40 megawatts, which people are hoping will actually materialize in the next uh, year or so. So energy really is a critical now, a critical, in fact, is the critical constraint in computing. Now, uh, there have been a number, there are a number of, um, you know, projects that make use of, uh, of supercomputers. Climate models are obviously one, something I'm heavily involved in. Uh, trying to simulate the brain is another one. And this was a, a project um, funded by the EU for one of their what's called flagship projects, which is basically a billion euros given to it, uh, to try to simulate the brain on a state-of-the-art supercomputer. Um, it seems like it uh, hasn't you know, lived up to its promise from the uh, uh, sort of 10 years ago when the project was being uh, pro pro uh, proposed. Um, I've not really had much to do with this project, except I, I use sometimes the same supercomputers that this uh, human brain project uses. But it's always seemed to me extremely ironic uh, that, you know, it's trying to emulate on a machine which takes 20 megawatts of power, something that actually takes only about 20 watts of power. There's six orders of magnitude discrepancy. Um, and I, it strikes me that that's one of the big uh, questions that has to be answered. How do we um, do, and I, was it Stuart, I forget now, who, who put up the number of uh, effectively bit operations per second that's done in a microtubule. And, you know, we're talking about exascale levels of computation, uh, essentially, uh, with 20 watts. So that's a kind of a key question. Why, why is there such a big discrepancy? Now, one small um, contribution, I suppose, to, to thinking about this that, that I, I've been interested in is whether actually the brain itself makes use of this idea of low voltage uh, uh, transistors, let's call them protein transistors in the neurons to amplify and, and, and uh, propagate the signal along axons. Um, does it actually make, does, does it actually, um, make use of noise or is there some, some sort of beneficial effect of noise that allows it to operate at very uh, low energies and low voltages? And um, in sort of reading the literature, it's been clear that uh, the, the brain is a fairly noisy uh, type of system. This was a paper by uh, Faisal et al. from a few years ago. Um, electrical noise in neurons causes membrane potential fluctuations, even in the absence of synaptic uh, inputs. The most dominant source of such electrical noise are electrical currents produced by the random opening and closing of voltage-gated ion channels. And then they go on to say the effects of channel noise increase dramatically as neurons become smaller um, in axons of less than 0.3 microns diameter. The input resistance is large enough that spontaneous opening, blah, 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 can occur and spont spontaneous uh, action potentials can be triggered. And um, it's noted that in the human brain, many neurons are actually below this 0.3 microns down to 0.1 micron. Um, now, again, trying to uh, look at the sort of state of the, or the kind of conventional wisdom uh, by looking at the textbooks on neural design, it seems that um, certainly people are aware of, of the uh, presence of noise, but it seems to be something that's treated as a sort of slightly undesirable uh, feature of the brain. And this was a quote from this uh, textbook, Principles of Neural Design, uh, where noise is inevitable, it should be minimized before transmission. So most neural designs try to prevent noise or reduce it at early stages. Um, now, I already mentioned in my own work, you know, we have certain advantages 
to, uh, to adding noise to our computational representations. Well, I would claim that these are actually a more accurate representation of the underlying Navier-Stokes equations due to uh, various scaling symmetries that these equations have. I don't have time to go into that. Um, but, you know, there are, there's a whole uh, plethora of, um, of cases where uh, uh, stochasticity is actually uh, can be beneficial. And so these are just two uh, textbooks uh, uh, itemizing certain sort of stochastic heuristic algorithms for th solving things like the traveling salesman problem and so on. And it seems to me, looking at this, that the base, one of the basic um, advantages of, of stochastics is that you often, when you have uh, deterministic heuristic algorithms, you, get, you may get many situations where the algorithm does very well, but you also get situations where essentially the algorithm hangs and it just takes forever to reach a, a solution. And so in an integrated sense, the performance of the deterministic algorithm is, is not necessarily that good. It's, you get this long tail where you get these excessive um, times to solution. And basically what stochastics does is just get, it wipes out that long tail. So it may slightly, it may slightly degrade the very, very best time to solution uh, instances but it, it removes that long tail. Um, this is a very sort of, you know, classic example of where you can get hang, you know, you can hang in a local minimum trying to find your global minimum and a, and a stochastic uh, perturbation can potentially uh, take you out of that and, and take you to, uh, to the global minimum that you're trying to find. Um, it's interesting that Turing himself, this is the famous uh, imitation game paper, um, from 1950, um, uh, the imitation game, can, can machines think? He actually uh, says on page 459 it's of the paper, it's wise to include a random element in a learning machine. A random element is rather useful when uh, we're searching for a solution um, to some problem. Now, I want to um, make some uh, sort of speculative comments first about the links of all this to creativity and then secondly to uh, consciousness. Um, and I want to give a couple of quotes, since we're in a mathematics department, I want to give a couple of quotes from uh, mathematicians, very famous mathematicians. Um, the first being uh, uh, Littlewood, of uh, Hardy and Littlewood, of course, fame. Um, this is from his miscellany on creative insight. And he says, it is usual to distinguish four phases in creation, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. Now, what he means by preparation and incubation is really studying the problem, your problem hard, you know, making sure you, 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 you've read the, all the papers that have been written on it and you're knowledgeable about uh, what you're trying to uh, work on. But then he says illumination, which can happen in a fraction of a second, is the emergence of the creative idea into the consciousness. This is my underlining, uh, not his. This almost always occurs when the mind is in a state of relaxation. Okay, so that's my first uh, mathematic mathematician's quote. The second is uh, Andrew Wiles uh, here. Um, in particular, I think this is from, here, from the book by Simon Singh on Fermat's Last Theorem, but this is Andrew talking about, again, creative insight. In particular, when you reach a, a real impasse, when there's a real problem that you want to overcome, then the routine mathematical thinking is of no use to you. Leading up to that kind of new idea, there has to be a long period of tremendous focus on the problem without any distraction. You have to really think about nothing but that problem. Just concentrate on it. Then you stop. Afterwards, there seems to be a kind of period of relaxation during which the subconscious appears to take over. And it's during that time that some new insight comes. Um, I think most of us can sort of relate to these quotes. I know uh, Roger in one of his books talking about how he came across the uh, singularity theorem um, had some idea crossing the road or catching a bus or something and it took some time to, um, to kind of realize what the idea was. But again, it was the crucial idea to proving the existence of space-time singularities, but it came at this sort of moment, not of focusing on the problem, but of doing something sort of um, seemingly trivial in one's life. Now, in this respect, I want to um, link this to uh, a, a kind of a, a categorization of thought, which maybe is too crude in some respects, but it's, it's a useful uh, sort of delineation by the uh, Nobel economist Daniel Kahneman. Uh, 
who talks about two types of systems, system one and two, basically one being the, the system when the brain is relaxing and the system two when it's concentrating hard. So the idea of Littlewood and, uh, and Wiles is that you have your moments of creativity when you're in system one um, rather than in system two. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a bit like, you know, you, in system one, you can have a conversation with somebody, you can walk down the streets, your legs can work, you can talk, you can maybe chew gum. Uh, and in so doing, you can have some sort of creative idea. In this case, it was the guy decided to, uh, for some reason, book a, buy a book on Patagonia, which will be where he goes on his next holiday. But the, the point is, it was some sort of creative idea which occurred when doing, when multitasking in some way. On the other hand, system two, you know, as characterized by this guy trying to maybe do multiply 23 by 17, he can basically do nothing but think about that task. He can't look, he can't hear, he can't walk. All that he can do is that one single task. The brain has to sort of shut down or, resort, or focus its, its, um, its resources onto that one thing. So the first part of my talk, I wanted to sort of suggest, this suggests to me um, a kind of a, a, um, a physical difference between system one and system two that might explain this phenomenon of creativity um, uh, in, in, the, in a relaxed state. So if you think about system one as being able to multitask, then it means what this 20 watts of energy is clearly in some sense spread pretty relatively uniformly around the neural network, which means per active, if per active neuron in the brain, there's a relatively small amount of energy available. And maybe it's in that regime that you, you drop below this deterministic threshold and the brain can be susceptible to noise. On the other hand, when you're in system two and you literally stop doing everything to focus on the single task in hand, then that available energy is, is focused on a much smaller subset of, of neurons, which means that the energy per active neuron is now relatively large. And maybe then you're above this threshold uh, for stochasticity. And then that's when things operate much more deterministically. Um, so the idea is, so this is where these two steps of, of, uh, hard, of um, Littlewood, rather, come in. The illumination is some kind of stochastic uh, jump when you're in this noisy system one, where the, you, the, act, the energy per active neuron is below the threshold for determinism. But to recognize that as a valuable insight, you need to do some analysis. And for that, you do that more in system two, uh, which is the more deterministic mode. This, uh, you know, Michael Berry, the physicist Michael Berry, would often refer to kind of creative insights as like a, an elementary particle, which he called a clariton. Uh, but he kind of bemoaned the fact that most of the time uh, you have a clariton and then it's very quickly annihilated by an anti-clariton. Um, and the idea is then the anti-clariton is when, the, uh, when this kind of uh, stochastic insight hits the, hits the, the, the world of deterministic analysis. Um, so um, so that's, that's the f sort of the first part of this. Um, and actually, I wrote a paper with um, uh, a, a genuine computational neuroscientist, Michael O'Shea, from the University of Sussex, where we kind of proposed this, uh, this kind of paradigm of a, of a very much a, a determined, uh, very much, sorry, a synergistic um, interplay between stochastic and, and deterministic uh, dynamical uh, processing. Um, now, it's interesting to think that, you know, how come, you know, are there any downsides to this idea of going towards very miniaturized neurons, which are potentially, can potentially be stochastic when the energy is spread across the large network? Um, and it turns out with very s slender neurons, your reaction time goes down. So if it's critically important, um, like Roger had the example of the, uh, the mathematician with the saber-toothed tiger about to jump on, on him. Um, you know, in those days when saber-toothed tigers uh, are likely to, to jump on you, having a fast reaction time, I guess, is an important um, uh, sort of survival mechanism. And therefore, uh, you know, maybe having too many very slender neurons would not be uh, 
uh, not, very, not very useful for that. Um, but the upside to some stochasticity is that, um, again, this idea you're less likely to just get paralyzed with indecision, you know, like a rabbit in, in headlights, or, or alternatively have very predictable um, uh, behavioral patterns. So, um, so maybe as we, got, as we became a more social species, the idea of, of, uh, of having exceptionally fast reaction times became less important and the idea that, that our, uh, our methods of, uh, of decision making were less uh, predictable became a more important uh, process. So maybe, so maybe then there was some advantage to, uh, to this very uh, essentially energy efficient evolution uh, and that creativity was in some sense, a, I suppose, an unintended consequence of that. Okay, um, so I want to, um, oh by the way, this is just one point I'd, I'd make in remark of, of Roger's uh, talk, that um, if some of this noise really is, and because, you know, these, these very slender neurons and the ion channels available to uh, amplify the signals are really, you know, down at molecular levels, and maybe some of this noise is genuinely quantum decoherent noise, um, then if, that, if one takes the view that the quantum decoherent noise is truly random, I mean, one could discuss that maybe, but if one takes that view, then that actually is a, uh, a mechanism for injecting something inherently non-algorithmic into the um, signal processing of the brain. So that may be a mechanism for accounting for why there is some notion of non-computability in the brain, that we are susceptible to some quantum decoherent noise. And this maybe also um, provides a, a kind of a, a link to the comment again that Roger made about Turing, that he viewed, you know, the reason why we are, you know, intelligent and not like uh, algorithmic machines is because we can make uh, mistakes. And in some sense, having a component of stochasticity provides at least the opportunity uh, to make mistakes. So there may be some links uh, to that point. All right, so I just want to come now to um, the second uh, part of the talk, which is thinking more, and this is, I, I, maybe the first part was speculative, this is even more so, but nevertheless, I think it's maybe of some interest, and as I say, it may be links to some of the things that were said yesterday. Because I've wondered often whether this principle of energy optimization might also um, account for why there are certain processes in the brain that, where quantum physics appears to play uh, a role. And I was, um, I, I came across uh, a paper by um, some authors, which includes uh, Gustav Bernreuder, who I don't know if he's in the audience at the moment, but um, somebody I, I met a few years ago, which I'd like to, to meet again. But um, um, this paper was about uh, how ions are conducted through the uh, ion channels that basically then power the uh, signal propagation in axons, and he ha they, they propose a mechanism uh, which, as it says here, um, builds on an alteration between quantum behavior and classical behavior with decoherences around one picosecond. Um, the details of this mechanism are, are not important for the purposes of this talk, but I wrote to, to Gustav and said, um, if you tried to um, uh, do this classically, if you tried to um, if you, if you tried to uh, propose a mechanism where you could get the same rate of transfer of ions uh, from purely classical mechanisms, what would, that, you know, what would that entail? And his basic answer was that the classical ions would have to have much higher kinetic energy to cross the potential barrier. In other words, this seems to be an example of a mechanism where maybe the quantum process has, uh, has evolved to be used, because the corresponding classical process would be much more uh, energetically uh, wasteful. Now, whether this is a general principle or not, I haven't really the remotest idea, but I would sort of throw that out to people who may know more than me about these things, about whether you know, one can formulate the role of quantum processes in the brain from, a, from an energetic uh, economy point of view. So I want to say a few words about uh, quantum mechanics, because again, this is something I you know, I think about uh, from my 
old uh, kind of PhD days and the, the old question about how do you marry uh, quantum physics with, uh, with, with gravitational physics, you know, is still a conundrum today as it was when I did my PhD many decades ago. Um, so <clears throat> so I, ha I do think, you know, uh, irrespective of, 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 uh, quant of uh, consciousness or anything like that, I do think quite a bit about the fundamentals of quantum physics. And in some sense, um, you know, there's a clue actually uh, I about quantum physics in the, in the basic constant of quantum theory, Planck's constant which has, uh, you know, th this uh, value. But the, the most important thing I want to raise is the units, uh, joule seconds. Well, OK, you can rewrite that in a different way. It's basically the dimension of momentum times position, which is the, which is the dimension of phase space. So what I want to argue is that uh, in quantum physics, uh, phase space plays a much more uh, central and, and vital role than it does in classical physics. And what I mean by that is the following. Um, in classical physics, if, you, um, if you're at some point uh, in, uh, in um, uh, well, let's say here in configuration space, and you have a trajectory uh, from, from here to here, we know that in classical physics, the trajectory is described by a principle of least action. You, it's, the, it's, the, it's the trajectory that minimizes the, the action integral. Now, in a sense, once you've found that trajectory, you can, pretty, you can ignore all the other trajectories. The only, this is the only one that's relevant. You know, the, the others are totally irrelevant. All that happens is the classical particle moves on that trajectory in state space, uh, the one that minimizes the action. The others are, are kind of unimportant in some sense. On the other hand, if you, um, if you go to quantum mechanics and, uh, for example, uh, think about the, the Feynman sum over histories approach, that Feynman sum over histories approach says basically take all conceivable uh, trajectories between A and B, all histories if you like, and you essentially sum over all of them um, with, a, with a suitable exponential, complex exponential um, weighting. So in some sense, from this perspective, you can see that, that state space is playing a much more kind of active role. It's not just that one single least action thing. It's somehow a, 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 the extended structure of state space is playing um, a role. You can look at this in other formalisms for quantum theory. This is the famous Bohmian approach where you uh, decompose the wave function into its kind of polar representation. Um, and you get, you get kind of classical-like equations. The equation for R, you, ba you write the Schrodinger equation for for psi decomposing it into this real, the real and, uh, and the phase part. The real part is just a conservation equation for probability. And this is a kind of Hamilton Jacobi equation, which looks very classical apart from the very last term, which is a, a potential uh, function, uh, which is often called the quantum potential. Uh, but this is not a potential in space or space time, it's a potential in configuration space. So again, it's pointing out that to understand quantum mechanics, you have to understand this structure, this kind of potential function on an extended here configuration space. Um, I'm just going to spend two, like one minute or 30 seconds or something, because I, I have my own ideas about this, and I just want to say them briefly, because it'll come back right at the very end of the talk. Um, I, I've tried to sort of work on a thing which I call invariant set theory, and this notion of extended state space structure comes about through a kind of fractal um, construction where if you take what you think at a, at a sort of low uh, magnification is just a single trajectory in state space and zoom into it sufficiently, you find it's actually composed of a whole helix of trajectories. And if you zoomed into those, that helix, one member of that helix, you would find it too would be composed of a helix of trajectories. Um, and if you, if you did a cut, a cross-section through, through one of these things, you would find, uh, you'd find a whole uh, slew of these trajectories at one fractal iteration, and then at the next one, there'd be another one, and there'd be more at higher and higher fractal iterations. This is a picture, this is a kind of topological picture of piadic integers, by the way. So there's a link here to piadic dynamics and so on, which I won't talk about. Um, so um, the process of decoherence is, is, like, is a little bit different to uh, the one that Roger talked about, 
insofar as I don't envisage, um, you know, sheets or, or trajectories actually branching uh, in any way, but rather they start to exponentially diverge, a bit like a classical dynamical system would. Uh, so these individual helix of trajectories under decoherence starts to diverge and eventually ends up clustering in one of two uh, clusters. And these would be the kind of eigenstates of some measurement operator. Anyway, I'm, I'm not um, trying to, I don't want to spend this talk talking about this. My only point is that this also has this notion of an extended state, uh, state space structure like the Feynman path integral or, or indeed the Bohmian structure. And that arises from this fractal structure of individual trajectories. I'll come back to that later. Okay, with all that in mind, I want to talk about this issue of consciousness. Um, and um, uh, I'm just going to blank that thing out for a second. You had a second or two to look at that picture. Um, because what I want to, it's a little bit, I think, like what Jonathan was saying. I don't want to talk about consciousness as a sort of generalized concept, but rather to think about consciousness in relation to specific objects in a field of view, to be conscious of something specific. So, for example, in that picture, you probably all were conscious of the woman crossing the zebra crossing, I would imagine, if you looked at it at all. Possibly you weren't conscious of the color of the car that was two behind uh, the woman. So, in fact, the, it was a red car there, you see. But you probably weren't looking at that, so you weren't conscious of it. Okay. So, I want to approach this, uh, my own at least, um, take on this uh, kind of um, problem. Um, in thinking about objects in a field of view, um, so, what it, what it, so what does it mean to say that, that you're, you're conscious of this, of this woman? Well, you had some notion then of this woman as, as having some separate existence to the fact you could think you could be conscious of her but not be conscious of the car, let's say, when you briefly looked at that picture, meant that you somehow had this notion that this woman was something an object in its own right, independent of all the other things in the rest of the field of view. And that's the question I want to address. How do we acquire this perception of things having some individual uh, existence separate from everything else? Well, a very simple example of where one can do that without any fancy physics or anything is uh, thinking about it like a speeding train. Um, because or any speeding object, because you can just look at the object at two instances in time. Essentially, the background won't have changed. The object will have moved. So if you just subtract the two, uh, the two fields of view, you can subtract out the background and leave the, the object. So if something is moving, you can be aware of that moving object. Obviously, that's how like a burglar alarm or something works. It's, it, sees, it senses the motion because it can subtract out the background from the moving motion. It becomes a bit more difficult when you think about, let's say, a bowl of fruit. Uh, how do I become sort of a, a conscious or aware of the bowl of fruit as having an independent existence um, to, um, uh, to the background, to the table and everything else that the bowl of fruit is on? Well, you know, when I ask this question to people, the general and including professional neuroscientists, they just shrug their shoulders and say, well, it's obvious, you know, in my memory, uh, I have many instances where I've seen bowls of fruit uh, in different settings, on different tables, and you know, different different situations. So, it's from that sort of collective uh, memory of all those bowls of fruit, I can abstract the notion of the bowl of fruit. And in a sense, I suppose when AI—that's what AI does—you give it zillions and zillions and zillions of uh, instances of something, a dog or something, and it abstracts the dogness from all those instances and subtracts out all the stuff that's irrelevant, that's non non dog-like. The question is, is that really all there is to it? And uh, I think even people, you know, who are, are profound believers in AI uh, are not convinced that that really is the way the human brain works, because you don't need to see a million instances of a dog to abstract the notion of dogness. And, you know, small children will know what a dog is by only seeing a dog like two or three times. So this concept that you need millions of um, instances to, uh, to really extract the dogness from the irrelevant parts of the picture I don't think quite, for me, doesn't quite hit the mark, and I don't think uh, it would um, for, for many people. So, is there anything else? So, this is where we start to get uh, maybe 
um, a little uh, sort of speculative, but so let's imagine we have a world which I'll just, a world which I'll denote by the capital letter U. Um, and I'm interested in just one thing, which is a foreground object O. And the foreground object O has values, you know, some values lambda. But there are all sorts of background objects which I'm not particularly interested in, but they, uh, they also contribute to my world and they have values of, of x, y, and z, little x, y, and z. So we want to sort of formulate this idea that O can be treated as independent of the background. So, well, that would be the case if, um, if there exist, let's say, plausible counterfactual worlds. So they, the worlds don't necessarily have to exist, but in my brain I can conceive, let's say, as plausible worlds where these background objects take different values to what they had in reality when I looked at the object. Uh, but, the, but the object itself, the lambda object, is, not, uh, is unchanged. So if we can kind of, if it makes sense to talk about uh, the ability to vary x, y, and z sort of randomly keeping lambda fixed, then obviously we can do this notion of subtracting out the background and, and sort of being then aware of the object O with value lambda. Um, so the question is, and, and I guess we do have this plausible, so that we do think that this is a, kind of a plausible uh, thing to think about, but, but where does that come from? So, as I say, the conventional, as a, well, the people I've spoken to who are neuroscientists say, well, that just comes from a memory of such worlds. So lambda is the bowl of fruit. Uh, we've seen the bowl of fruit in all sorts of contexts, so we can sort of vary across uh, the, the backgrounds X, Y, and Z, and then that way subtract out lambda. But there is another possibility, and that's what I want to uh, propose here, um, and this seems to be the right kind of audience to do it, that maybe this notion arises from the fact that, that there are quantum processes going on in the brain, and these processes necessarily are feeling out this extended structure of state space. They're feeling, they're, con they're, they're dependent on if you think about the Feynman path integral, for example, they're dependent on all these other worlds, which, you know, they have to be weighted, suitably weighted. But, but it's not just that one least action trajectory. The, 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 the quantum world that affects our, our world is somehow built on the fact that there's this extended structure in state space, which has to be taken into account. So these, ex these alternate worlds you could think of as counterfactual worlds. That's basically what they are. There, there are other things that, that the particle might have done. It might have gone this way, it might have gone that way, it might have gone this way. So that's the question. Is our cognition, the, the notion that we perceive these alternate worlds actually uh, a, a kind of a consequence of the fact that there are processes in the brain? Stuart gave us a lecture yesterday about some of it. The paper by Ben Ryder was another example. So could this be the, could this explain this very visceral feeling we have not only of being conscious but also of having free will because free will after all is, 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 is kind of having the notion that the world in which we could have but we didn't do otherwise somehow has, a, has, a, has, a, has existence. So as I say, this is, this is, uh, is not really the same as, as what Roger and Stuart were talking about, but, but I feel it's kind of a, of a similar kind of flavor to it. I'm, I'm kind of stressing more this notion that these alternate, so Roger showed this branching structure. I, I just feel rather than branching, we're talking about some exponential divergence of structures. But nevertheless, by saying that it's this extended state space structure that's important when we talk about the quantum world, then we're inevitably involving in our, um, and quantum processes being important to our brain, we're inevitably involving these counterfactual worlds that exist in state space as playing a role in our cognition. So that's the basic concept. Um, so I just want to, um, slightly lost track of time. Oh, 32 seconds. I'd sort of love to say this because in case there's any quantum people in the audience, because I find this uh, uh, provides a, an, an interesting um, perspective on why we find quantum physics so weird. Uh, so I'm going to say it and translate it in 32 seconds. Um, 
because we, if this is what I'm saying is true, that we have this perception of counterfactual worlds, I feel that what actually happens in the brain is we, we tend to accept all of them as sort of equally plausible. We're, we're kind of indiscriminate about counterfactuals, a, any potential counterfactual. I could have, you know, I didn't cross the road, I could have crossed the road, I, I didn't buy that lottery ticket, I could have bought that lottery. We kind of treat them all now, you know, in our, we just have this blunderbuss approach in our brain that all of them are, are potentially physically plausible. Now, I've done quite a bit of work on this uh, work, uh, uh, this problem of, of entanglement and the Bell theorem in this framework of invariant set theory. And it turns out that um, what makes, uh, it turns out that to, um, yeah, it turns, I have to read this. Um, uh, Okay, yeah. So th the thing is, you might have seen there were kind of gaps. You had these, this helix, but there were kind of gaps in the helix, uh, fractal gaps in the invariant set. And it turns out that when one tries to interpret the Bell theorem in this invariant set framework, it inevitably involves considering the counterfactual experiments that fall in the fractal gaps. Now, in invariant set theory, you would just reject those counterfactual worlds because they don't fall on this set as being unphysical. But if you had a very blunderbuss approach to counterfactuals and say they're all plausible, then you end up with a very um, incomprehensible, I would say, picture about how quantum mechanics works. So I think uh, this picture actually gives you, uh, uh, perhaps gives some insight into why we find quantum theory. So, uh, so, um, so zero seconds left, so I've got to the conclusions. Uh, human creativity may be a consequence uh, to one of exceptional energy efficiency, and there's a specific uh, process here which, in, which may, very much makes use of what Littlewood, uh, the kind of process of Littlewood of illumination and verification. In other words, it's a synergistic interaction between two modes of operation, basically one uh, deterministic, the other stochastic, which is defined by the uh, relatively small amount of available energy to the brain and whether it's concentrated or dispersed. Um, um, I've said about consciousness could be arise from an implicit awareness of counterfactual worlds made possible by quantum physics. And maybe quantum physics also is, occurs in the brain because of energetic reasons. And so if that's the case, then consciousness too could be a consequence of evolution towards an organ of exceptional energy efficiency. Thank you.